Good everyone, welcome. Good to see you all here this morning on what's turning out to be a nice sunny day, albeit um, a bit wet if you're, if you're driving. Um, and it's lovely to have you here. And obviously welcome to folks on Zoom who perhaps looked out and saw the weather and decided not to come. Um, or just because you know, you're joining from too far away, it's lovely to have you with us as well. It's good to continue to come and to worship and to welcome each other. Uh, in Hebrews, Paul, um, Paul, who some people think wrote Hebrews, but whoever is the writer, says, uh, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So if you are uh, usually here, then I welcome you as a brother or a sister. And if you are a stranger, yeah, I'm not going to say whether or not you're angelic, but you are welcome here too. We all come to welcome each other, to share as God's family, um, to enjoy all that he has for us and to give him all the glory. So let's start to do that as we sing together. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. Let's pray. Lord God, we come this morning to give thanks to you, to give thanks for your everlasting love that you have shown us, to give thanks for your mighty hand and your outstretched arm that have helped us and healed us, protected us. But most of all, we come to give glory to Jesus who has shown us that God is faithful, that God is with us. We come to rejoice in his name, to sing his praises, to acknowledge his work in our lives, to sing and tell and pray of all that he has done. So we ask you to come this morning, Lord Jesus, and, and make yourself known to us, whether 
It is a familiar presence or a brand new feeling to know the presence of the living God in us and around us and through us. And we know that we have not always remembered that you are faithful. And indeed, we have not always been faithful ourselves. That we have not been faithful, we have not been strong. We have not walked with you this week. And so forgive us our sin, Lord. As we turn back to you, help us to know that through the work of Jesus we are forgiven. That there is actually nothing that can hold us back from being with you and knowing you, feeling your love, knowing your presence. That nothing we have done is unforgivable. And that if we turn to you, you are there waiting. So come, Lord Jesus, and make your name known among us. Make your presence felt among us. Make your voice heard among us. And as we come as your family, brothers and sisters, we come and we join together in that family prayer that you taught your disciples, saying together, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So, uh, almost exactly a year ago, uh, we were in the midst of COP26. Um, seems like a long time ago now, actually, but it was just a year ago and uh, all that happened there. And one of the things that we did there was we uh, spent some time working with YWAM and we had a whole bunch of YWAMers come from all over. They come from bases all over the UK, but actually the people came from all over the world to come and be part of cop 26 and to pray and to worship and to do outreach in Glasgow as part of that fortnight um, and one of those folks was Daniel um, who some of you will know if you've been part of the student cafe has been coming up uh, faithfully all the way up from West Kilbride uh, down on uh, the very west coast near Largs down in Seamill where there's a YWAM base he's been coming up to help with our student cafe um, and uh, as if that wasn't enough he's also decided to come and help with, uh, uh, with some stuff on a Sunday morning and he's brought some of the guys from, from YWAM and I'm just going to invite Daniel up with, uh, with Tabitha and they're going to introduce um, what they're going to do this morning because um, he'll explain it better than I will. Well, uh, good morning. It is wonderful to be with you all again. Um, I've got such fun memories of this church and the people here. Um, so today, uh, yeah, as Ben said, I'm part, I'm with YWAM, which stands for Youth with a Mission. The YWAM wants to do, um, mobilize young people to uh, bring and share the Word of God. Um, our goal is to know God and to make Him known. So. The, I brought with me today some of our trainees who are busy doing a discipleship training school at the moment. That's a six-month school where three of it is intense lectures um, from topics ranging to Father Heart of God to Holy Spirit to really quite in-depth studies. Um, and part of their school is they're doing a Word by Heart school which in the school they attempt to learn Bible stories and scriptures off by heart by um, the word of mouth tradition that was used in the Old Testament. Part of this is trying to help them experience the story as an eyewitness. And so one of our students, uh, one of the trainees, Tabitha, has been, is on the school 
and she's got a story that she'd love to share with you. One day, a religious expert stood up and decided to test Jesus with a question. He asked him, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, what does the law of Moses say? H how do you read it? And the man said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbors as you love yourself. So Jesus told him, you are right, do so and you will live. But the man wanted to justify his actions, so he said, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered him with the story. A Jewish man was traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho, but on his way, he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothing, they beat him up, and they left him beside the road, half dead. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over to the man and he looked at him, but then he also crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. He walked over to the man and he soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and he bandaged them. He put the man onto his very own donkey and he brought him to an inn where he could further care for him. The next day, the man went to the innkeeper, gave him two silver coins and told him, care for this man. If his bill should run any higher than this, I will surely pay you back the next time I'm here. Now then, who of these three men was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The religious expert replied, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, yes, then go and do the same. Then go and do the same. While I was studying this story, I pretty quickly noticed that I would not have done the same as the Samaritan, and I would have been the priest or the temple assistant passing by, hoping nobody saw that I saw what just happened. So I was wondering, how can I be so selfless as the Samaritan? The Samaritan paid two silver coins for a man he didn't even know. Two silver coins, that's the equivalent of a half a year worth of wages. So how can, I, how can I so radically put other people's needs before mine? And I pretty quickly noticed I can't, but God can. And this story has challenged me to ask God for his heart and to ask him for his compassion so that I may see other people as he sees them. And I want to actively seek for opportunities to serve people and see my neighbors and know my neighbors and serve my neighbors. So who could your neighbors be? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tabitha. And uh, yeah, well done on uh, well done on getting through without, without notes. Um, and that's obviously what they're trying to do to memorize scripture, but also um, not just as a mental thing, a mental process of learning something, but actually through that process, having it go from head to heart, through learning it by heart, um, the feeling and actually asking the important questions of ourselves. Um, so thank you for coming through. Um, and we'll hear a bit more from um, some of the other folks later on when we come to pray. But let's pray now um, and uh, pray.
pray that question to ourselves. Lord Jesus, who is our neighbor? I pray, Lord, that you would give us greater compassion. You'd give us a bigger heart for those in need. That you would give us eyes that see those in need and the strength to not pass by on the other side. Help us to be more like you, to go and do likewise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's uh, sing once more. We're going to sing, The Lord's My Shepherd. Let's, uh, let's sing uh, again, let's worship, um, and we're going to sing, uh, My Soul Finds Rest in God Alone.
Uh, so before we turn back to uh, prayer, uh, the guys from YWAM are actually just back from Belfast. I think they go back on Friday. Um, and so uh, just thought we'd ask um, Miriam to come and just share a bit about what's been going on uh, as part of their outreach in Belfast. Um, so there you go. Um, yeah, we just came back from Belfast and it's a city very marked by division. There's a lot of pain there uh, in the city and you can see it like there are walls dividing the Catholics and the Protestants. So there's a lot of pain there. And I just wanted to share uh, an encouragement. Uh, we were a lot involved with uh, working with teenagers and youth um, and also children. And uh, God is really working there. There's a lot like stirring up. He, um, he's reaching out to the young people to bring hope. So one evening we went to a youth group with uh, older teenagers. And as soon as I stepped in the door, I could really feel God's heart for the youth there. It was like I was struck by this love for them. And I just wanted to, to be God's hands and feet and just show them that love. And it was beautiful because I, I could see that God was really like touching their hearts as I like gave them attention and I, I worked from that place of love. And um, yeah, you could also see on the teenagers that they were suffering like with mental illnesses and and there's a lot of like attack on the youth today so it was beautiful to just be able to show God's love um, and yeah that God is he's not given up on anybody but his love is just it's always reaching out and it's coming in action and he doesn't want us to suffer like he doesn't want us to suffer with mental illnesses he wants to to free us from that and it was just beautiful to to be able to be part of that for that one night uh, and it really motivated motivated me and gave me new passion and and just the excitement of of being used by god that like it it makes a change change his love changes things so just an encouragement from our outreach there Thank you. And I know that obviously a few of you well acquainted with Belfast and uh, I'm sure uh, it's good to hear that there are things going on. And it's good to actually hear, I should point out that we've got four YWAMers, none of whom are from Scotland. Um, we've got, uh, we've got uh, uh, Miriam's from Sweden and Tabitha's from Germany. And, um, but I'm actually going to ask Daniel to come back out and actually just share, um, also not from Scotland, um, but uh, you've been here for a while now. Um, but you want to just share a few prayer points on how we can pray for you guys um, and what you're doing next? Well, um, yeah, so the, they are now, there's a few more weeks of lectures left for this uh, discipleship training school. Um, weeks that are coming up this coming week, we've got a guy coming to speak on uh, Father Heart of God. Um, then it's uh, World Missions, then it's... Um, uh, biblical worldview, um, relationships, and yeah, then then they're going to be preparing for outreach. We got uh, two teams with two sort of set locations. Um, one of them I'm not sure is safe to mention on air. The other one team will be going down to uh, London to work with uh, urban key refugees, uh, youth, and other sort of drugs and programs and stuff there um, so yeah the that these things will come together well would be a prayer point that the remaining weeks that they are spending in lectures that they will get as much from that as possible and that yeah the outreach will be probably from about 12th or 15th of December through to um, through to February next year so it's a, quite a while that will be gone. Um, many of the trainees, it will be the first time that they are having Christmas or New Year's away from their families in a foreign country in unfamiliar environments. So uh, praise for that as well would be very much appreciated. How many folks have you got on your DTS at the moment? Um, we are at the moment with six staff and with 10 trainees. Okay. Yes. Brilliant. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, and just now, Jaron is the yes, other one sorry, there. Yes. He's from Canada. So, yeah, yeah cool. Yes, sorry. Should have no worries. Mentioned all the places. So, yeah, thanks, Daniel. Let's um, 
So let's, uh, let's pray now for them and, and, and for other things. Um, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord God, for the work of YWAM. Thank you for the work that they did here last year as part of COP26 and for the relationships that were established there. Thank you uh, for the team that came up to Freshers Week to pray. And thank you uh, for, for Daniel and the guys working down in West Kilbride to, uh, to know Jesus more and to make him known more. And we do want to pray, Lord, for these next few weeks of study, Lord, that you would speak to them and encourage them, prepare them as much as they can be prepared. Um, and that as they go out onto outreach, as they spend time away from home, away from family, particularly those who have come from uh, out with the UK and are now going to be um, in a different country over Christmas and New Year for the first time. We pray that you would comfort them and strengthen them, that you would give them uh, more amazing testimony, that they would be able to tell of all that you have done, and Lord, that when they do go back home, that they would go home with hearts on fire for you, with lives that are dedicated to making you known to others. So I pray that you would be with them and be with the staff as well as they deal with uh, all the issues um, and all the practicalities. And we ask that the outreach would go smoothly over, these, uh, over, the, over December through February. Thank you, Lord, for all their enthusiasm and their excitement and for that passion to make you known. And may we too have that passion. And I thank you. Thank you for promises made and kept even though so often we fail to keep our side of the bargain and when it feels lord that our world is teetering on the brink of disaster we know that you will never abandon your people you have shown us time and again you are a faithful god but it can be tough lord to hang in there we often feel like giving up <coughs> Are those times when life seems too hard or too painful, when those around us suffer, remind us of the words of prophets that have sustained your people throughout generations and have come true again and again in Christ Jesus. Today, Lord, we also pray for all those who are troubled in body, mind and spirit. We think of those young people in Belfast, but also our own students and young people. May they know your presence and be reassured by your words we pray for our world its leaders its policy makers and its protectors help them to make wise decisions based on justice and tolerance we think of the upcoming cop 27 of all the promises that were made and then broken from cop 26 for the consistent failure to treat your world well to prepare this world for those who come after us. We pray not just for good decisions, but for integrity in following through. We pray for ourselves that we might see light in dark and difficult places and that we might be the light when others grope for meaning. We pray for one another here, Lord, those beside, behind and in front of us that we might wait in trust and love together that as we might go from here we might share your promises with all that we meet that we would know you and make you known in jesus name amen let's sing once more he will hold me fast
I'm always struck by just how bizarre uh, English is um, when you sing a song like that and you wonder why God is holding us quickly. Um, whereas, in fact, in this particular case, holding me fast means holding me tight and secure, um, not necessarily re- relating to speed. Um, we do that all the time and quite often I know I don't notice when it's happening um, but it's a uh, yeah a funny thing and even worse I think in churches uh, so many of the words that we are so used to saying um, are, uh, are peculiar to English I was thinking about it this this week um, there's a new film uh, being produced about the life of John Wycliffe uh, one of the first translators of the Bible who was executed for doing so, um, but his desire to create uh, an English Bible that people could read and understand and actually to memorize, um, and uh, between him and Tyndale, two of these great uh, English translators, working so hard to make, uh, make scripture available and easy to read, um, and sometimes we, uh, we don't do them proud by making it more difficult. However, we can rejoice in what they have done as we turn to scripture. Um, we're in the story of Exodus. Um, we have, uh, last week we had the battle of the Amalekites. So we've come out of Egypt. We've gone through the Red Sea. We've had manna coming from heaven and quails and water coming from rocks. And, and then we've had our first big battle. Um, and, and we're really now in a, in a real flow of the story um, and very similar to lots of stories that we would watch in film. Um, we have the kind of the birth of the hero and then the hero gets exiled for some reason and then the hero returns and then has various trials, the plagues, the Red Sea, the provision. And then you have the big final battle, uh, which is the Amalekites. And, and now we should come to the closing victory scene the crowning of uh, the King of Gondor, or perhaps Han, Luke and Chewbacca receiving their medals at the end of Star Wars, or maybe uh, Simba's child being held aloft over the savannah in The Lion King, or whatever is your particular favourite film. That's what should happen next. Um, Instead, we get this well-known scene where the hero's parents pop in to give him some advice. I don't remember that from any of the films that I've watched recently. I'm not sure that has happened all that often. But that's what happens here. And we're in Exodus chapter 18. And we have the return of Jethro. Exodus chapter 18. We're going to read the whole chapter from 1 through to 27. Exodus 18 beginning at verse 1. Now Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. And the other was named Eliezer, for he said, my father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the wilderness, where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and about all the hardships they had met along the way, and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, Praise be to the Lord, who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, For he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood round him from morning till evening. 
When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me. And I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must bring the people's representatives. Sorry, you must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. Let them serve as judges for the people at all times, but let them, carry, let them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter, because they will share it with you. If you do this, and, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way and Jethro returned to his own country. Amen. So, as you will be beginning to realise, although this feels out of place, there aren't really any mistakes here. This has been placed here for a specific reason, this slightly bizarre story of Moses' father-in-law coming to stay. And the first thing we should do, as we've done frequently, is notice that there are a number of echoes here. A number of echoes backwards and forwards. Firstly, we're about to reach the mountain of God. We're told that they are camped near the mountain of God. The last time Moses was here, he came down from the mountain and was reunited with his brother. This time Moses is reunited with his father-in-law before he returns up the mountain. First time Moses met Jethro, he has resolved a shepherding problem and they share a meal together. This time Jethro comes, they share a meal together and he helps solve Moses' shepherding problem. But even more so, there are actually a number of very deliberate parallels between last week's story and this week's, between the Amalekites and Jethro. Which sounds odd, but actually when you start to see them, you realise that this is quite deliberate. The Amalekites come and attack. Jethro comes and greets. Men are chosen in both passages. Joshua chooses some men in, in uh, the Amalekite battle. Jethro, uh, sorry, men are chosen by Moses uh, from among the people. In last week's story, Moses sat on a stone. This week, he sits to judge. In both cases, something happens the next day and lasts from morning till evening for the whole day. And in both stories, Moses is very tired, but receives help. It's important to notice these echoes happening because it underlines the importance of a seemingly random narrative interlude. Helps us to go, do you know what, this is important. This is not just here as a funny story, but it's trying to tell us something. And there are really two bits to the story. We've got verses 1 through 12, and, uh, which is the the arrival and then the, the meal 
And then we've got 13 through 27, which is Moses coming to judge the people and Jethro saying, what on earth are you doing? You're running yourself ragged. So in that first part, we start with Moses' children. We don't actually know, we've never told at what point Zipporah and the kids are sent back to their father-in-law. Um, we're just not told. We know that they come through initially to Egypt with Moses. But at some point they've, they've been sent back, whether it's because of the plagues, whether it's because of uh, something else, we don't actually know. And various commentators will speculate various different places as to when it might have happened and for why. But I think it's probably enough to say, we don't know, but obviously at some point she'd gone back with the kids. And now she comes back with her father, her father to see Moses. And by the looks of it, stays with them from here as Jethro seems to go back on his own in verse 27. And then we're very clearly told the names of these children again, because names are so important. It's interesting that actually throughout Exodus, Pharaoh is never named. And yet Moses' children, who don't really appear all that often, always get named. First one is uh, Gershom. I was a stranger in a foreign land. And then the second one, Eliezer, meaning God is my helper. Moses says, my father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Again, Moses himself saved from the sword of Pharaoh, but also the people of Israel saved from Pharaoh. So you have these two children named here. And they are echoing Moses' story. They're echoing the story of the people of Israel. And so they come back and they meet and they greet. And, and then there's hugging and kissing going on. And um, it's, all, it's all very happy, which is good. Obviously, Moses has a good relationship with his in-laws. Um, and that's probably a good thing. Um, I have to say, there's one or two verses in here I need to memorize if my children ever get married, particularly verse 24. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. It's a good one to remember. Uh, you can put that on a postcard next to your bed or perhaps on a card for your children um, at a later date. But Jethro comes and he hears all that has gone on and Moses gives testimony to what God has done, tells him everything that's gone on and, and, he's, and Jethro says, Ah, the Lord your God is greater than all the other gods. And if you remember back to all the declarations that Moses gives to Pharaoh consistently, what God is saying is, I'm going to do these things so that everyone will see that I am greater, that I am God. And here we have someone who's not an Israelite, he's a Midianite saying, the Lord is greater than all the other gods. In verse 11, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the other gods, for he did this to Pharaoh, who had treated, did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. God has been saying this all along, that other people will know that I am Lord. And this is the first fruit of that. Someone from another nation knowing that God is, is God. And he comes in and he brings the first offering. And again, all the way through, Moses has been saying to Pharaoh, let my people go that we may go into the desert and make offerings to the Lord our God. And the first offering that is made in the wilderness is made by a Midianite, a foreigner. Isn't that interesting? And then Moses and Aaron and all the elders gather in the presence of God to have a meal. A, a covenantal meal, perhaps. The first meal that's mentioned since the Passover. The Passover which in many ways divided the Israelites from the Egyptians. And now a covenantal meal 
in the presence of God between Israelites and Midianites. And so is Jethro a Jew now? He's made this great declaration of faith. He's made an offering to God. But actually, there's no indication here that he is circumcised, one of the key parts of the Jewish covenant. Nor does he actually remain with the people. He heads back off at the end of the chapter. So it's a very strange thing that's going on here, but it's obvious, obvious that these are beginning to be the fulfillments of what God is calling the people of Israel to be, which is a hope for all the nations. A declaration and a proclamation to all the nations that God is God. And then we move into this second part and, and uh, beginning at verse 13 and Moses grabs a seat and all these people gather around and, and they're looking for him, looking to seek God's will. And, and Jethro goes, what on earth is going on here? Do you not realize that this is never going to work? You could work every day for the rest of your life and not deal with all these problems because they'll keep on being more problems and there's an awful lot of these people here. But, but why does God choose to speak through Jethro here? Moses speaks with God as to a friend. It is Moses consistently who is interacting with God. And yet, in this case, God speaks through Jethro. And I think just sometimes God speaks through the strangest of people. Sometimes that's us. We can be a bit strange. And sometimes it's through others, the least that we will expect. I have a friend who, um, uh, from St. Rollox, um, who had been thinking about whether or not to uh, leave her current job and go into uh, another job, um, which was a, a kind of uh, pastoral assistant kind of role. And the thing that really nailed it for her was 30 seconds of clarity from a friend with Alzheimer's as they were walking down a nursing home corridor who suddenly stopped and looked her dead in the eye and said, this thing that is on your heart to do, you should really do it and do it with all your heart. And then was away again. So let's be sure that we are attentive to listen for God's voice in the voices of others, even our in-laws. And actually, we need to be careful not to over-spiritualize. What, what Jethro suggests here is very practical, actually quite common sense. There's nothing spiritual in many ways about what he says here, but, but actually, it's entirely spiritual. Because actually, sometimes practical solutions are the godly solutions. Sometimes the spirit works through common sense. And we need to be careful not to look at something and go, well, that can't be of God because it just seems like a good idea. It's just like, that, that's not actually so often the way that God works. Sometimes it's not the spectacular. Sometimes it is. Sometimes God does work in mysterious ways but I think sometimes we so convinced ourselves that God only works in mysterious ways that we miss him working through things much less mysterious I read earlier on from Hebrews the, the whole idea of showing hospitality to strangers for some have done by doing so have entertained angels without knowing it not instructing us to go out and look for angels and show them hospitality. It's just saying, be nice to strangers. And maybe you'll entertain an angel and maybe you won't. But if you don't, well, you've entertained 
strange. Uh, you've entertained angels, maybe, but certainly you've shown hospitality. You have loved a neighbour. And why shouldn't that just be a good thing? Why shouldn't that be a God thing? And, and the other thing that becomes clear here is that again, and we've said this all the way through, that this, this book is not about Moses. It's about what God does. It's about actually putting God back at the center, not the man of God. Moses shouldn't be the central character in the story of the people of Israel. The Lord God should be the central character. And actually, the church traditionally has been very bad at this. Which is probably one of the reasons why I'm up here talking to you. Because actually over the course of history, the church has been very good at saying, here is the man of God, and that everything filters through him. But that's actually not helpful or healthy or particularly scriptural. And particularly within the Church of Scotland, if we're going to be reducing ministers at the current rate, some of us are going to end up with churches the size of the people of Israel. And coming in every day to sit and listen for God, for people who come and say, what does God say about this? When actually what scripture says is we have the mind of Christ. That actually we should all be part of this family. And that actually if we want to plan for decline, the best way of doing it is making everything filter through one person because they won't be able to manage it. If we want to plan for growth, then what we do is we say, actually, well, what's common sense? We share the burden. We share the load. We know that one person cannot do it. And so we say, actually, okay. The one person is not the person who stands up here. The one person is Jesus. And we all have a responsibility to minister for him. To help each other. To help each other here. To help each other grow. To love each other. <clears throat> and to love our neighbours. We each take responsibility for each other. And that way, it doesn't matter if there are 20 people here, or 200, or 2,000. Everyone will have the opportunity to be loved and cared for and helped. Everyone will have the opportunity to become good disciples, to know Jesus, and to make him known. And then God will be at the center, which is where he always should be. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for Jethro, this strange priest of Midian, who seems at times to know you well. I pray, Lord, that we would seek to know you <clears throat> for ourselves and for each other, that we would seek to be your hands and your feet for ourselves and for each other, that we would recognize that there is one mediator between us and God, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. But also, Lord, that we would recognize that we are your family, and we bear responsibility for each other and I pray you would help us to love you well to know you more and to make you known in Jesus name just a reminder that if you want prayer for anything 
Um, it doesn't really matter what it is, if it's something from the service or something not from the service, it doesn't matter. But if you want prayer, um, if you just make your way down to that front corner um, once we've finished and there'll be folks there who'd be more than happy to pray with you. Um, it'll be confidential. You don't need to share specifics if it's something personal, um, but it's always good to get prayer if you need it. And sometimes actually, even if you don't. But let's close uh, today by singing the hymn, Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided. Go, go and listen for God's voice. Hear him in the sunset and the rain. Hear him in the words of scripture and the words of strangers. Hear him with the spirit within you and the cross before you. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.